Well, good morning. I'm behind schedule today. Uh, the technology was my uh, my laptop was acting strange, and I hope I can still uh, find some folks who want to do this this morning. So let's uh, let's have a word of prayer, and then we will we will jump in and get started. Here they come. Hey Kim, sorry, technology problems this morning. The beauty of technology. All right, let's pray together. Morning, Glenda. All right, Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for all your blessings. Lord, be with us as we study your word today. Wake up our minds. Let us take out of it today what you would want us to see. Lord, we love you. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, good morning, Peggy. Where's my mom's here? Having some technology issues this morning. All right, so today we're in Matthew chapter 20. Welcome to the Morning Watch, a, uh, a time together where a bunch of folks read and study God's word one chapter at a time one chapter all right today we're Matthew chapter 20 hey Kim hey Connie all right here we go so Jesus is we're, we're going to open up right in the middle of a of a talk that Jesus was giving he says for the kingdom of heaven is like the landowner who went out early one morning to hire workers for his vineyard he agreed to pay the normal daily wage and sent them out to work okay he's telling a parable here at nine o'clock in the morning, he was passing through the marketplace and saw some people standing around doing nothing. So he hired them, telling them he would pay them whatever was right at the end of the day. So they went to work in the vineyard. At noon, and again at three o'clock, he did the same thing. So he brought on new workers at various times in the day. But remember, there was a group that had been working there all day long. Okay, remember that. At five o'clock that afternoon, he was in town again and saw some more people standing around. He asked them, why haven't you been working today? They replied, because no one hired us. The landowner told them, then go out and join the others in my vineyard. So he's been bringing on workers all day long. Okay, at different, different, different phases. <clears throat> that evening, he told the foreman to call the workers in and pay them, beginning with the last workers first. Then those hired at five were paid. Each received a full day's wage. When those hired first came to get their wage, they assumed they would receive more, but they too were paid a day's wage. When they received their pay, they protested to the owner. Those people worked only one hour, and yet you paid them just as much as you paid us who worked all day in the scorching heat. He answered one of them, Friend, I haven't been unfair. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? Take your money and go. I wanted to pay this last worker the same as you. Is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Should you be jealous because I'm kind to others? So those who are last now will be first then, and those who are first will be last. So he says this is like the kingdom of heaven. So really, <clears throat> he's speaking to a few groups. Number one, we know this. A person who is saved right before the return of Christ is going to receive the same exact benefit, the same exact uh, 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 resurrected body, eternity with God, worshiping with Him as someone who was saved a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago. Okay, But he also, this is a little bit like the prodigal son, the older brother, the prodigal son, who was angry because he'd always done what he was supposed to do and always be at this this... This younger brother went out and sowed his wild oats and ate with pigs and came back and was given back and given all the things that, and he's like, he was, he was upset. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know, they were the religious experts. They've been working all day in the fields. And yet these new Christians who come in and are grafted in are angry because uh, they, the, these new Christians are getting the same, are getting the same thing. Okay. So there's multiple levels here of this parable that we can explore and look and see what the what the connections are. Verse 17. As Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside privately and told them what was going to happen to him. Listen, he said. Now this, this is very, very, very uh, explicit in terms of he tells them exactly what's going to happen. It always surprises me a little bit to see how shocked they were when, the, when Jesus was actually crucified. He says, listen. We're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die. Then they will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, flogged with a whip, and crucified. 
On the third day, he will be raised from the dead. How? What, what, what more do you need than that, right? Very, very uh, specific details. Verse 20, then the mother, uh, now this is, this is interesting here because this is one of these questions because following Jesus comes with a cost, right? Um, he says, then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her son. So mama, mama brings the two boys to Jesus. She knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request? He asked, Jesus asked. She replied, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. But Jesus answered by saying to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? So the mother was asking, you know, oh, this is going to, you know, um, I want my sons to be exalted to a place of high honor in your kingdom, Lord. That's what she's asking. And Jesus was like, you know, I, I don't know that you understand what that really means. You know, it's not a place of political or earthly honor. It's a place of humility and service. And it's, it's not going to be easy. Being first in my kingdom is not going to be easy. Um, oh, yes, they replied, we are able. Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup. And they do. James, yeah, they, they do. They struggle. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. My Father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. So it's interesting here that we know that the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are the same. Or they're one, but they're not the same. And so here Jesus is saying, I don't know who that will be. Only the Father knows. Okay. When the other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. They were mad. But Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came, listen to this, a very important verse, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The view of leadership, the view of service, the view of, of being on top is not the model that Jesus is going to give. How does our world today define power and, and status? It's how much money you have, right? How much political power you have. How big a house you live in. How nice a car you live in. Um, what boards do you sit on? Okay, All the things that are influential. Jesus is saying here, the mark of service in my kingdom is going to be that person who puts himself or herself last. Right? Last. Um, says, whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. There's no greater example of, of, of a servant leader than Jesus. He, he put himself last in order to serve those that he was given. Uh, remember the the washing of the feet. If the creator God of the universe in human form washing the nasty feet of his disciples. That's what a leader does. He says here, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. As we approach Easter, Easter's coming. Right? Jesus came to serve and to give his life. So that if we just accept him, trust in him. What did the Philippian jailer say? Men, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas looked back and said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's good news this morning. All right, last last thing, then we'll close. As Jesus and his disciples left the town of Jericho, a large crowd followed behind. Two blind men were sitting beside the road. When they heard that Jesus was coming that way, they began shouting, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Be quiet. The crowd yelled at them. But the only shouted louder. I love it. Persistence. Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Then when Jesus heard them, he stopped and called, What do you want me to do for you? I think we can borrow a little bit out of this, out of this section here because think about a prayer that you've been praying for a while. And maybe you think God's not listening or you feel like it's not moving or you don't see God moving. 
here we see two men who are blind who yell at Jesus as Jesus walks by just to get his attention. And 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 we know that Jesus knew they were there. We knew that Jesus heard them. But Jesus turns and says, what do you want me to do for you? When you and I have a prayer, we lift it up to God. God turns his ear toward us. He's never too busy. He's never too occupied to listen to the prayers of his people. What do you want me to do for you? That's what he's asking you this morning. Okay. Um, verse 33. Lord, they said, we want to see. Jesus felt sorry for them and touched their eyes. Instantly they could see. Then they followed him. Our response. <clears throat> our response to Jesus being so gracious to us and saving us is illustrated. Our response is illustrated here. Then they followed him. How can you not follow Jesus after he saved you? How can you not follow him after we understand what he did for us on Calvary? It's impossible. Obedience is a natural proud product of gratitude. Right? We're grateful. We're, we're thankful that he saved us. So just like these two blind men, then they followed him. All right. I love you all. See who else here is Kathy and Kim and Robin, my sister, Veronica, Barry's here. Y'all have a good Wednesday. It's hump day. It's all downhill from here, hopefully. Um, I got a busy day of meetings. And uh, our youth starts back up tonight in person at Central. So super excited about that. All right, let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this day. Be with us and guide us in all that we do. Lord, we love you. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. I love you all. Sorry for the tech issues this morning. Y'all have a blessed Wednesday, and we'll see you tomorrow for Matthew chapter 21. Oh, Barry, I will. Absolutely. We will be praying. Virgil, yes. We'll be praying for you, Virgil. Absolutely. Love you guys. Love you, Virgil. Love you, Barry. Y'all have a blessed day.